Hello everybody, welcome to our series of two webinars called Social You, focusing on use of social media. The two webinars will help you get started or improve your presence on social media platforms such as Facebook and Twitter. In collaboration with Safe Kids, uh, we have developed two webinars on Facebook and Twitter. The first one focuses on Facebook, how you get, can get your message out, best practices and do's and don'ts. The second will focus on Twitter, Twitter jargon, trending, best practices and ways to drive engagement. Uh, in this uh, and the next webinar, Safe Kids have promised to help us out. Safe Kids have a long track record of using social media and their team efforts are led by Julie Canelli, Senior Public Relations Associate. Julie will help uh, present her tips and advice to us. Thank you very much for that. But before I hand it over to Julie, I just want to remind you to provide feedback to these webinars. Any questions or feedback you may have can be given on this form that is found on our website. Your feedback helps us designing new webinars and ensure that we offer what we offer is relevant to you. I will stop now and I would like to hand it over to Julie. Thank you very much. Hi, this is Julie Keneally with Safe Kids Worldwide. I want to thank you guys for having us and we'd love to share information about social media. Um, as mentioned, Safe Kids has been using social media for a long time and we have used it successfully to reach parents and caregivers, public officials, and others with safety information. Safe Kids focuses on unintentional injuries to children, so the majority of our posts are geared around safety tips for parents so they can help protect the children, which you'll see through our examples as we go. Of course, each of these um, best tips and practices are able to be used for all types of posts, so we've kind of made it a little more general so that everybody can use this based on their needs. Today we'll be talking about Facebook and we have PowerPoint slides up, but we'll also be jumping around to Facebook and other um, programs to show you how to best utilize Facebook. We'd love to hear your feedback in the evaluation link that was on the previous slide, so please if you watch this send us notes about how we can improve or what you found helpful. To begin, I'm going to go through some statistics to show the importance of Facebook. Um, you can see from this slide that 1.65 billion people are on Facebook monthly. The citation for all of these are in the corner if you'd like to go there. This was updated just last month. Of those people, 1.09 billion people use Facebook every single day, and that's a huge number. So if you think if you can even reach 1% of those people or 10% of those people, the amount your message can get out there using Facebook is huge. It's a platform that's easy to use, it's inexpensive to use, and its reach is widespread. To look at how Facebook has grown over the years, this chart is interesting. Just from 2008 to 2015, you can see how big Facebook has grown. It's a huge platform. It started out with just college students in the United States, and now it's grown to be used by almost everybody across the globe. Um, for safe kids, we use it to reach parents and teens, but we've also seen an increase of older adults and grandparents using Facebook. So we've crafted messages to reach each of those populations. If you're wondering how often people use Facebook in the real world, the average person uses Facebook 20 plus minutes a day. And for me, that's obviously a lot more. But if you think about how often you just scroll through your news feed or check your Facebook messages, it probably does add up to at least 20 minutes a day. So this is, again, just showing how powerful this is and how often people are on Facebook. Millennials is a term that's important to safe kids and also important to people working in road safety because of this vulnerable population. 15 to 34 year olds, especially the teenage age group, are vulnerable on the road. Um, teen drivers are at greater risk for crashes than other age groups. So it's important to try to reach millennials and using Facebook is a way to do that. 91% of millennials use Facebook, which is almost 
an insane number. That's 91 percent of all those age millennials are on Facebook at least some point during the day. So you can see how you could reach this population through using Facebook. To talk through a little bit of our best practices, these are things that are based on facts that we've also seen in our own use. A link post is when you have a post that when you click on the photo or the word, it brings you to a website. So for this page, it would go to those sleep safety tips. And this is important because it drives people back to more information. So you can see the tip doesn't have a lot in there. It's a, a very short message, so it keeps people's attention. And then if they want more information, they could click on that link and it would drive them back to Safe Kids' website where they could learn more information. Another best practice is the use of photos. Photo posts do better on all social media platforms than posts that don't have photos. You can see from this chart that photos is the most popular, followed by videos, and then text and link are fairly consistent. So using photos and videos in your posts will make people see them more and drive more engagement. So I'm going to jump off right now and show you how to do one of these posts. So if we go to Facebook, this is what Safe Kids page looks like right now. To do a link post, you would take a post. So let's say we have a social media guide here. This is one that we've, we've written for road safety. If we wanted to do a link post, you could copy the link and post it on Facebook. When you paste that link, it will bring up a preview of the road, there's a the text, which is Safe Roads, Safe Kids, and a preview of what's on the page. It will also pull an image from that page. And then you can go back and take the text, and you can either leave the link if you want it there, but you don't have to have the link because, whoop, because Facebook already has it there. So this is what's considered a link post. It'll be able to click on it so that when you click on it, it brings you to that page. If we post this now, you can see that it will drive people to more information about the campaign, which is really the end goal. We want people to engage with the post, but we also want them to learn more information about it. So that's a link post and how you would do that. If we wanted to do a photo post, we would do the same thing because we still want to drive traffic to our page. So we have the link and we put our text in And then the difference between a link post and a photo post is the changing this to have a different photo. So if you want to add a photo, let's say we want to add this photo. If you publish this, you can see it looks a little different. It has a much larger photo than the one we just posted. And it's more visually appealing, especially when you used on mobile devices. People are more likely to read posts that have images attached. So those are the two types of posts that you want to be using a lot. Um, the link post driving traffic back, but the photo post making it more visually appealing. So if we go back to our slideshow, we want to talk through some best practices. And these are things that we've found not only through trial and error about which posts do best, but also through focus groups. We've had focus groups around some of our campaigns where we've had parents or even grandparents and older adults, and we would show them posts and ways to write things and get their feedback on it. So a lot of this comes from input we had from these people, and then also trial and error of posting and seeing what works. 
So for your audience, it's important to not only post, but to post and then see how people are reacting to the post. If people are liking the post a lot, you know you're doing something right. If there's not a lot of engagement, the next time you post, you can try to tailor it a little differently. So for this one, this is actually really difficult to do when you're talking about safety tips, but always and never are two words that we've learned you should never use. And this goes back to the fact that parents and all people in general are not perfect all the time and it's not reasonable to expect they will be. So if we use absolute words like always and never, we found that it turns people off because it's just not realistic. So for the examples, a bad way to write something would be never let your child play sports while hurt. It could lead to more injuries. And while that's true, and while it's an important safety tip, a parent reading that will realize that that's almost impossible to do, and they will just move on and not read your information. So if you switch that, a good way to say it would be, do you have a child that plays sports? And asking that question at the beginning is something that will engage the parents and make them want to read on. Yeah, I do have a child that plays sports, so I should read this message. Here are a few tips to help you learn about concussions and other injuries. And then that would link in the link post to more information. So this is a good post because it gets the, the reader intrigued with the opening question. And then it offers a few tips and it tells them what they're going to learn. So they know what they're clicking on and they know that they need to know that information because they answered yes to that question. So you can see it doesn't even have a lot of the tips there. This isn't a stat post or a tip post. It's just a way to drive traffic back to your website. Another one is about um, not making people feel like they're doing a bad job. So it's not making people feel guilty about what they're doing or not doing. Because we don't want them to think that we're just pointing our finger at them and telling them they're doing things wrong. And this is for both parents and regular people. So a bad thing would be using a statistic like this number of children die in every year in house fires. Don't risk your child's life. Install smoke alarms today. And this is a post that we did actually see on Facebook. This is bad because it's, first of all, it's very grim. And second of all, it's kind of pointing the finger at parents, like don't risk your child's life. If a parent were seeing that, they would be like, not, not really looking forward to seeing your next post because it's very grim and it's pointing the finger at them and telling them they would be doing a bad job and would be bad parents if they didn't install smoke alarms. But fire safety is an important message, so how can you get that out without doing that? So a good way to write that would be, we know you're really busy, but installing smoke alarms will give you peace of mind all year. Learn more. And this is kind of showing that you're relating to people. And with road safety, it's the same way. We know it's hard to do certain things. People still text and drive even though they know they're not supposed to. But and then that's where you put the safety tip. It's really important to not do it. It's really important because of this. Or doing this will make your life easier. And relating to people is going to help. We know you're really busy, but getting a car seat installed will help keep your kids safe. Those types of posts will do better than if you have scary stats about children dying. Another best practice is that the majority of parents want to keep their kids safe and want to be good parents, but there are things that they're not thinking of. Um, and we found this out through research, and there's also research for road safety that's about to come out that we'll use for this as well. So like with the texting and driving example, we know that texting is dri and driving is bad. Everybody knows that. So why are people still doing that? And those are the questions that you need to ask yourself when you're posting things. So for this one, we said a bad example is always keep your medicines up and away and out of sight. Now, if you posted that, 
parents would be scrolling through your page saying, yep, yep, check, 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 I do this. The same thing with if it was bad, never text while driving. You'd be like, yep, I know, I don't see that. But why is it still happening? And that's the question that when you're writing these posts, you need to ask yourself. And as experts, you know, you know some of the reasons people are doing these. Is it because they're getting a phone call from their boss? Is it a teen who's getting a text from their friends or a text from their parents asking them to call? Is it someone texting at a red light because they think that that's OK? Um, when are people doing these? When are the exceptions that are getting people in trouble? So those are the good posts where you want to make people think of the, the times they're not thinking of. For the medication example, a good way to write that would be, don't forget about medicine in person, on the nightstand, or at your baby's changing table. Those are three examples of times that parents may not be thinking about medicine. So even those parents who say, yeah, I keep medicine up and away, might not be thinking about it in their purse, or putting medicine on nightstands, or the baby changing table. So for the texting and driving example, you could say something about, don't text and drive even at stoplights, or even if it's your boss. Things like that will really get people thinking of, oh, yeah, I actually do do it at stoplights. And getting that message out will be helpful in making people realize the times that they're doing it wrong. I touched on this briefly already, but we want to stay positive. As nonprofits who work in road safety and deal with statistics and tips that are about preventing death, it's, it's very easy to slip into using statistics that are huge and scary and awful because we think that it will, that it will jolt people into action. And that's not always true. If you continuously have statistics that are about death or that are very scary and gruesome, people will actually start to unfollow your page. They don't want to see that when they're on Facebook. They're on Facebook as a break from the real world. So putting these kind of statistics, like this example, is not only going to make people not pay attention to your post right now, but they're also probably going to eventually unfollow you. So for these statistics, um, we know these statistics are important because it drives the point home about how often this happens. But for Facebook and for all social media, turning it around to be ways that you can prevent the injury and death rather than focusing on the statistics about the injury and death will get people more likely to read your posts. So in this one, 334 children died in home fires this year. Make sure your kids are safe. That's a huge number. That's scary. But I'm not going to keep being excited about seeing these posts. So a better way to phrase that would be, working smoke alarms reduce the chance of dying in a fire by nearly 50%. Is your smoke alarm working? And you can see I included some of the best practices that we already talked about with the question, where it engages people and makes them think, oh, is my smoke alarm working? Have I checked it lately? So really trying to be positive and teaching people the tips to stay safe rather than focusing on the statistics or things about death will make people more likely to come back to your page. When we're talking about safety tips, it's easy to overwhelm people because we are experts in this field and we know an overwhelming amount of tips and we want to get them all out to help people and keep them safe. But for social media, it's important to have easily digestible tips, so one tip at a time. Especially when people are looking on their phones, having really long posts is going to be hard for them to see, and they're just going to scroll past it quickly. So using one tip at a time will be more likely for people to not only read it, but also share it with their friends, especially if it's something that's easy to do and they may not know about. So for this example, instead of just driving people to your page, doing a tip post where you have a message for every 20 minutes of play, a child should drink 10 gulps of water, you're hoping that people will go, aha, I didn't know that. That's something that my network would find interesting or need to know. And just having one tip 
will make them likely to share it rather than posting our top 10 tips or featuring all those. And those tips are still important and that would be what you would link to in the link post so that if they wanted more information they could click on it. But if they don't want more information they still have one important tip that they can share. We want to drive engagement on our Facebook page because we want people to interact with it. If they're just scrolling through their news feed and they don't interact with it, they may not have actually learned something. So ways to drive engagement are asking the questions, which we talked about already. Have you ever texted while driving? Have you ever done this? Have you ever ridden your bike without a helmet? Have you ever not worn your seatbelt for whatever reason? Have you ever driven a child without a car seat because you didn't have one at the time? Or even asking questions about other people. Have you seen other people doing this? Because people may not want to admit to their bad behavior themselves, but they may admit that they've seen other people doing it. Have you ever seen someone talking on their cell phone while driving? Have you seen someone run through a red light? or pass a school bus. Things like that will make people stop and think if they've actually done that or not. Yes, I have seen people run through red lights. I have seen people drive on the wrong way down a one-way street because it was faster. So questions will make people think and probably engage with your post and post in the comments. So the goal of the question post is to get people to post in their comments. Another way to drive engagement is to ask people's advice. And this goes back to those situations we talked about that are the exceptions to the rule. So yes, everybody knows to not text and drive, but, and then asking people's advice. With car seats, it, it's very easy to ask these things. How do you handle if you're carpooling with a family and they don't have a car seat? How do you get your kid to not unbuckle themselves? How do you tell your kid that they have to stay rear-facing longer? How do you tell your teen that she's too short to be in the front seat? Asking things like this will get people to respond to your posts and sharing information. And the sharing of information will drive more engagement because other people will see their answers and respond. And you might get some good ideas that you haven't thought of before. So asking people's advice is something that we don't often do because we're, we see ourselves as the experts and we want to impart knowledge, but every once in a while you should ask people because you'll be surprised at what they might say. Putting facts in your posts will increase shares. I like to do the facts on the photos because I think it makes it for a nice image, um, but if you need information and you don't have a lot of facts, I'm sure that you do, but Safe Kids has a road safety fact sheet if you're looking for new statistics that you haven't used before. Another way to drive engagement is to just ask people and ask them to share or like the post. Um, asking them to directly do this has been shown to drive engagement up. So writing, share this post if you do this, or posting a tip and then saying share with your friends or like this post if you didn't know this. Asking them to actually do it will drive engagement up. And then another way to drive engagement is responding to comments. So if people are asking questions or writing posts, you can respond to their comments and that will drive more engagement. Not only will these people see that you're a real person, and that you care about what they have to say, but they'll respond, you'll respond, and it'll start a conversation. And those conversations are a lot of the time where the learning occurs, especially with the people who are negative on your page. Building a following is important on social media because people won't see your post if you don't have a following. So a few different ways to do this. Of course, I have to say that advertising is the best way to build your following because that's how Facebook is modeled now. Safe Kids does use some advertising to build our followers. Of course, there are other ways to do this that don't cost money. One of those ways is to follow other people. So the people that like your post or comment on your post, follow them 
and they might follow you back. Following other organizations that work in road safety, following government, other public officials, celebrities in your country, important people in road safety. Following those people will show people that you're following them and they'll see that you should be followed too. So it'll say, Julie followed safe kids, you should too. And that way you can grow following because it will show up in people's news feed. Another way to build a following is tagging your partners in posts because then it will show up on their feed and all of their followers will see it. So you can see in this post we tagged a bunch of our partners who were working on a campaign. With each of these partners, it came up on their news feed, so people who followed Nationwide Insurance will then see our post. So they may not have known about Safe Kids before, but now they know that we work with Nationwide Insurance, and so they'll follow us as well. While we're talking about partners and other organizations, sharing their posts on your page is a great way to build the followers, again, because they'll see that you shared the post but also because it's easy content. It's, it's free, there's nothing that you have to do. You just go online, share someone's post, and you have your post for the day. It's the easiest way to get information. And sharing other organizations will build your credibility. So if you share from the UN or the Red Cross, um, those kind of organizations will help build your following and your credibility. Again, I'm putting respond to comments here because people will see that you're a real organization, that you care about your followers, and the interaction will show up on people's news feeds, so it will expose you to more people. So friends of people that are commenting will see your responses. Another way to build your following is to post from events. So people who are at an event will see that you're posting about the event, and if they may not have known you before, they'll know who you are now. So if you're attending a conference or a road safety event or anything like that, you should post from that event because people will see that and you'll get, again, a little more credibility, but also just more visibility with all the people who are attending that event. We're going to go into a little bit of more tactical things. Photo editing, I'm putting all of these sizes on this page so that if you'd like to come back and size photos, you have everything you need right here. If you're posting a photo from an event or something like that, you don't need to edit your photos because it looks more real and you post live. But if you're trying to post a professional photo, it makes sense to edit it into the exact size needed so that it fits perfectly. In this example, we didn't want to cut off the top of the child's head or cut off words or anything like that. And you can see that each of the sizes is pretty different for each um, social media channel, which is frustrating. It would be great if they were all the same. Um, for me, I like to use Photoshop to do photo editing. So I have the size saved here, and this is a template um, I, that I could share if you'd like. If I wanted to save a photo or edit a photo, what you would do is you would take the photo. Let's see which one we could use. We could do, let's do this photo, or let's do a road safety photo. So here's my road safety photo. And to edit it, you would just copy it and paste it into your template and then you can resize it. So I'm doing it this way so you can see that it's really just shrinking the photo down to the correct size. And this template is actually for Twitter, but it works the same way. And you can see how easily it is to position the photo how you want. Right now, you wouldn't know that it's a road safety photo. But if we make it smaller, there you can see the crosswalk and you can see the children walking to school. So now I have it saved and it's sized perfectly for Twitter. And this is through Photoshop. Um, there are other ways to resize photos, but I find this to be the easiest way. 
And you can also use Photoshop to add text. Adding text to photos is just a good way to put another message out there and it gives you more words. Especially for Twitter where you have a character limit that's shorter, adding the words here gives you just more space. And as people are scrolling through their phones, the photo is actually the first thing that they see. So they'll see the photo first and then if they're interested they'll read the text above it. So say we wanted to We could add text here, and we could change the color. Let's say we just want to do white. And then you just save your image. So now you have a perfectly sized image. You know that there is going to be text on it. You can see how it's going to appear. And this, these templates, or resizing it this way, will make it so that you look really professional. And Safe Kids has a bunch of photos that we've sized already for road safety. Um, we have those on our website that you can download. But if you're looking to make your own, this page will be helpful for you. A few best practices for photos on Facebook. Using happy, smiling kids is going to draw more engagement. And sometimes this is hard because of the subject that we're talking about. Again. Um, just the, the death and the sad statistics are hard to pair with a child, but to, to drive engagement, it's actually better to use happy, smiling children like the one you see in the photo. Secondly, having children that are looking directly into the photo engages people more. And I'm not sure if this is because it looks like they're looking at the person or what, but um, statistics have shown that kids looking into the camera in their photos do better than children who are looking sideways or off in the distance. Infographics and statistics perform well as photos. You can see in the bottom of the screen here, putting one stat or one tip into picture form um, does really well as a social media image. And if you if you don't know where to find these, we have a lot of them on safekids.org. Um, I could show you quickly. If you go to safekids.org, here's our website. And if you click on safety tips, you could scroll down to infographics and it will bring up all of our infographics. And we have some in different languages. We have lots of different topics, but for road safety, you could come here and cut a portion of the infographic out, or you could download this as a PDF and save it. But using these quick and easy stats is really nice on social media. It's clean, and it's a great way to visually show the image. Posting photos from your events is a really good way to show engagement on social media. It, again, shows people that you're an organization who's doing things in the world. Um, they can see the types of things that you do and the good work that you're doing in your country. So posting photos from events is something that we recommend. And then also just showing diversity in your photos, which sometimes is hard if you're using stock imagery, but making sure that these children um, not only represent the people in your country, but represent a diverse population because Facebook is global and you may have followers from all around the world. So those are just some of our photo best practices that we've learned. Scheduling a post is something that will make your lives easier. We know that you guys are really busy, and we are too, so I'll often sit down at the beginning of a week and just schedule out the week of posts. It just makes my life easier knowing that it's done and knowing that I don't have to do it every day. So to schedule a post, if we go back to Facebook, and let's say we want to do that post again, but we want to do it tomorrow, we could copy the link again, and then let's copy the text again. We'll just do a link post without a photo for now. To schedule the post, instead of clicking Publish, you click this little arrow right here, 
and you can either schedule it, backdate it, or save the draft of it. So if we want to schedule the post, we can click on the calendar, and let's say we wanted to do it tomorrow, and let's say we want to do it at 11.30 in the morning. We can schedule it here, and you can schedule, you can see you could schedule pretty far out if you have events or things that you want to plan ahead of time. But we want to do it tomorrow, we can click schedule, and then it shows up here on your post or on your feed. So let's say that we realized we don't actually want to schedule that post, but we already scheduled it. You could go and see the post. And we could see it here. And you could edit it here. So you could publish it right now. You could remove it from the schedule. You can reschedule it for a different time or you could delete it. So don't worry, scheduling a post isn't, doesn't mean that you can't change it. So we'll delete this one for now. But this, this scheduling the post will be very useful for you guys. Um, it'll just make everybody's lives easier because you can do it all at once. Something that we get a lot of questions about is monitoring or responding to comments. Again, because of our busy schedules, it's hard to monitor and respond to all comments, and it's hard to watch for um, people who are being negative. So we have a posting policy. This is word for word what our posting policy is, um, and it works for safe kids. You could, if you want, you could copy and use this yourself, and then we link to Facebook's rights and responsibilities. We have this on our page. Um, it's a separate tab. Um, I could show you where it is. If you go to our page, it's our posting policy here. So we have it published so that people can see it, and that way we can monitor comments. Another way that you could do this is by blocking curse words, and you can do this automatically. So this will give you peace of mind. You don't have to worry when you're away at a conference if people are writing bad things on your page. You can block curse words automatically, and you can choose the words that you want to block or not block. And when this happens, if someone were to use a swear word that's blocked, Facebook will automatically hide that post. And it doesn't delete it because it doesn't want the person to think that you've deleted it and then write something mean. But that person will be able to use their post still, and they'll think that it's still there. So you'll be covered because no one from your page will see it, but that person will still think it's there. Facebook also has a sanity filter, which is how you can set up so that Facebook will automatically remove what they deem as profane language. And you can set it to medium or strong. We have it set to medium. But this will, again, just give you peace of mind that if someone is writing profanity on your page, it will automatically be hidden so no one can see it. And the way that you do both of these is through your Settings tab. So if we're on our page right here, you can click Settings, and it brings up all of these options. One of them is Page Moderation. And this is where you can write words that, if they appear on your page, will be automatically hidden. So if you clicked that, um, you could put any words you want in there um, that if they appear on your page, they'll automatically go on. So racial slurs, swear words, um, negative language, you could put any of that in here. The profanity filter is Facebook automatically choosing these words for you. And you can change it to off, medium, or strong. We have it set to medium, and then we've added, we've done both that we can choose which words we want, but also have Facebook choose some of our medium settings. So I recommend doing these if you haven't already, because it will just leave you covered so that you don't have to worry about monitoring your page all the time. And again, that's under settings on your page. And that's what we have today for our Facebook training.
If there are any questions, you have my email address or my phone number here, and that's a US number. Um, or you could take the evaluation, and we'll look through those as well. Um, but thank you for having me. I hope you found this helpful, and I hope that you see Facebook as a useful tool for promoting your messaging. Thank you very much, uh, Julie. Um, could you just show us the next slide, please? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, please remember to, uh, as Julie said, uh, to evaluate and, and you can put your questions uh, if you have any to, to this webinar and you can find the, the form on our website using this link. Um, we, we encourage you to do this because we would like uh, to be sure that uh, the Alliance Empowerment Program brings you relevant and useful information. Thank you very much for listening and have a safe day. Thank you.